Sixers. I mean, Boston. Boston, yeah. Why, why, do, you, why do you hate Boston? Because <laughs> they're racist as f***. That's yeah, they why. Nasty. They will say nasty. They will say anything. And it's fine. I mean, if it's you my life. It. I mean, I've been dealing it. with my whole life. I don't mind it. Like, I hear it. Like, if I hear somebody, like, close by, I check them real quick. I move on to the game. Whatever. They're going to say whatever the f*** they want to say. They might throw something on you. I mean, I got a beer thrown on me leaving the game. You know, like. Boston is. I mean, yeah, Boston it's is. It's the only place in the NBA in America you go yeah. and they have, like, shirts that say, like, f*** LeBron. Yeah, like, it was like a whole like section. It was, it was like, like, like a LBJ t-shirt. <laughs> I believe they probably sold it at the team <laughs> shop. KJ and Don Darrow on WEEI. Um, thank you so much for starting your Sunday with us. 617-779-7937. The text line is 3-7-93-7. That is LeBron James on his show, uh, The Shop, where him and players uh, from various sports, but primarily the NBA, are discussing issues of the day. And you've heard the comments. The comments have gone spread like wildfire that Boston is racist AF, quote, from LeBron. You know, Mark, I'll say this. I find it interesting because a lot of the conversation is that LeBron is a minority owner inside of the Fenway group. And part of clarify real quick first that you're a black man and I'm white. Okay, yeah. For those who don't know, yes. Okay, yeah. I have been my whole life. There's yeah, I mean, I don't know what the definition other than that is, but here we go. So part of that ownership group includes the Liverpool soccer team over in the British uh, Premier League. And FIFA spends millions and millions of dollars on the end racism campaign where at games you will have monkeys hung in effigy, a banana thrown at players, um, blackface in the crowd, and FIFA is actively making a, 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 a pathway to end racist behavior at their games across Europe. LeBron's part of the ownership group. He should probably say, you know what? Look, if there are issues like this, because there are no issues like this in the NBA. Nobody is throwing banana peels. Nobody's doing monkey calls that that have been reported. If someone says F LeBron on a T-shirt, that's not racist. Correct. That, that's not racist. It's, it's, it's derogatory, but it's not racist. And so I was telling you, Mark, when we both talked, we we're going to say this on the air. Um, at another station I worked at here in Boston, uh, a, a, a well-known newspaper in town came out with a series, Is Boston Racist? It was a four-part series. And I can't remember the lady's first name, but her last name was Johnson, and I had her on the air. And the specific point I nailed her down on was the part of the article dealing with the makeup at the sporting events. And the one she got caught up on was the Cavaliers game. This is when LeBron was still with the Cavs. And how she mentioned that there was such a low number of black people at the game. And I said to her, well, I went to the Dallas Mavericks game and people were recognizing me on a radio station. It was only three months old. That's how many black people were there. And she said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, the cost of a LeBron ticket is much different than the cost of a Dirk Nowitzki in his last year ticket. Economics is at play. And so to say that the fans as people are racist, you could not say that. Is the structure off? Potentially. Now, here's where I will say this about LeBron, and I'm not going to defend him at all. What if he had a real big sit-down conversation with Bill Russell? Like, for an hour. What is it like? I own part of the Red Sox and some of the group. What is it like? What? Tell me your experience. What would the answer come back that Bill Russell would have? The experience of what? Being in Boston? playing? Yes. In Bo- not Boston. playing. Being. Right, because playing is just your job. Yeah, the structure is where you live. Okay. So if we were having a conversation about a businessman or a guy who drives the train or a person who works does landscaping or has a landscaping company, he's part of the structure. He's not part of the entertainment. And one of the issues I do have is when these these stories come out and they're like, "Well, so and so didn't have a problem." So and so. You're usually naming players. You're not talking about people who are part of the structure. LeBron is never going to be part of the structure here. He's only part of the games. So he can say what he wants to say because he doesn't have to be part of the structure. So if you're having a conversation about the structure, well, then you would say, hey, well, Boston's not the only place that has a problem with the structure. And in fact, Atlanta is a place where one night it's primarily white, and there's a set price, and then the next night, it's black, 
and the price is much greater. And that's in Atlanta. And that tends to be the mecca of where black people seemingly want to be. So there are structural issues everywhere. Yeah. Well, let me just say this. I lived in Georgia for almost two years. Mm-hmm. I face. I, I didn't face it. That's not what it was. But in terms of hearing racist comments, yes, I heard more down there than I ever heard living here. So that's just in terms of hearing people, white people, make racist comments. But it's beyond the comments, right? Because comments are comments, but how you live, right? Just because I put a sign in my yard saying I might support something, it, it may not show it because there might not be any black people that live in my entire neighborhood or the three streets surrounding me. So economically, I can say I can buy a sign, put it in my yard and say I'm for something. But structurally, you don't see it in my house. You don't see it in my neighborhood. We don't we don't associate outside of work, which is probably is going to be more required than it is voluntarily. So it's much easier to say I support something um, financially but not actually do it in your real life. It, it kind of tends to show up around prom season. Where I, I'm not you following have, the structure thing. Like, wh- you explain that to me a little bit more. Like, the wh- structure is is what if you're going to go with the racism term. Yeah, you can't put it on fans because you don't know those people individually. Okay, but if you're talking about a structure. Then, yeah, it exists in Boston, it exists in New York, it exists in L.A. and San Francisco. These things are structurally built in that it has nothing to do with the fans. Now, some of the fan base may benefit from that structure because they do not face the same roadblocks that others who have to live in that structure do. Okay, so I'm gonna. I have a different take on LeBron James, and I see what you're saying. Like LeBron's not a part of this community, right? So he he can't know everything that goes on in Boston. Is that what you're saying? Sort of, he, right? So okay. to put it on the fans, yeah. as people, no. But as a person who's lived in the structure, who lives in the structure, I understand what he may be saying about the structure of Boston. Okay. But you just said the structure. There's faults with structure in a lot of cities, right? But that would, but that would really ruin a narrative for a lot of people. Yes, right? it would. because because now we're saying, oh wow, it might really be systemic racism, right? So again, to put it on an individual, you don't know because you don't know the individual. So Go here, ahead. here's what I was going to say. Number one, I am not going to tell or say to LeBron James or conclude that he's never experienced racism in Boston. I have no idea. Maybe he has. Maybe he's heard it from the fans. Maybe he's heard racist comments. I don't know one way or another. So I'm not going to say he's wrong or he's lying or anything like that. What I am going to say, though, is LeBron James is LeBron James. He's one of the most famous people on earth. One of the, Probably the most famous athlete on earth. When you speak, when you make a comment, people listen. Your words carry incredible meaning. Okay? You cannot. Now, what was happening in this show? Okay, I don't know if you see all the whole thing. They were interviewing Marcus Rashford, who is a part of Manchester United. He's a black guy on Man U. Okay? And he's talking about what you were talking about. That's right. The the real racism that he faces and the initiatives that are in place over there. Right. And he's trying to deal with it. Okay? I think that LeBron, while trying to sort of appeal to Rashford, who was on the show... Okay. Just sort of threw out, oh, because that's the narrative that's out like there, me Boston. Too? But yeah, look at me. I dealt with it too. Boston's racist too. They're racist as bleep. Yeah. And, and, and what he failed to realize is that, like, okay, again, I'm not going to say what he has or hasn't, but that's an explosive comment that you just made that is now everywhere. And by default, there are going to be people out there, kids, adult, like people that have never been to Boston, right. who now conclude that Boston is a racist city just because of what you said, you know, and I, and not to get over dramatic about it, but you're LeBron James and you have a huge, enormous platform. And I think what he said and the way he said it was irresponsible. You have to be better if you're LeBron James. If that's the case, if you've experienced racism, you have to act almost as if you're like a leader. Uh, and Because that's obviously something you don't want one of the preeminent cities in the country that you live in to be viewed as racist, you have to be a leader in that scenario, a la comments made by Jalen Brown a while back, where he talked about the systemic racism that he sees and that he's experienced, but he did it in a way that was measured and professional. He talked about how we need to address it and we need to be better and fix it and focus on things. He didn't just off the cuff say that it was, uh, 
you know, Boston's racist as bleep and then laugh about it and then say, look, I, I, I don't mind or whatever he said. Like, no, that's a mess. You're LeBron James. You have to be more measured and calculated. You have to think about what you're going to say when you make a comment that on that topic that, that that's that explosive. People are going to listen. They're going to react, and it's going to mean something to a lot of people. And I think that he was reckless, and, and really, out he should have. If he was going to bring that up, he should have done it in a more measured way. That was a reckless thing he did. I thought. You're checking out KJ and Don Darrow on WEEI 617-779-7937. Let's go to Lewis in the car. He wants to join in the conversation. Lewis, thanks for joining KJ and Don Darrow. Absolutely, guys. Thank you for having me. Um, it, let's just speak openly and honestly. There is, in fact, a dark underbelly when it, uh, in Boston when it comes to prejudice or racism. Do you guys believe that or no? Yes. On an economic sense, yes. Economically, absolutely. Right. It, Exactly. And but the thing is, it's it's not so much that there was this show I was listening to on your station before this morning show before there. And it wasn't too much of the host, but it was the callers that were coming in. And before that time, I didn't think that you had people who in that number who thought like that in Boston. But as I'm listening to these callers over, you know, over a couple of weeks, over a month, I even stopped listening to the radio station now, until now, Greg full, came full, over and I started listening to it again. Let me put you on pause for a second, Lewis. Don't hang up on him. Um, the show that's on before us is part of a network feed. So it's not a Boston-derived de- conversation. No, 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 no. Before no, no, us. you're misunderstanding me. Like your, okay. your WEEI show. I don't want to say the name of the show and those guys oh, okay. who were on there. But okay. right before uh, Greg came on and Danielle, you had a couple of guys on there. Okay. And it wasn't so much them. They would hint around a certain area, but the callers would call in. It shocked me that, that, that that's the way how Boston felt on certain issues. I was surprised by that, I'd be honest. But now I have a new thought. And what we have to do as a people is we just, like, as human beings, we just stop racism. Stop the prejudice. I'm not going to be uh, uh, like this underbelly. And, and it's dark and it's an underbelly. It's not right in the open. So what we have to do as thinking men, as civilized men, is close the door on it. We don't want to hear none of that garbage. We don't want to hear anything like that. Let's go out here and have a good time. Thanks a lot, guys. Bye. Thanks, Lewis. So, Mark, can I give you a bit of perspective? Yeah. Because I, I mentioned I worked at another station before I came here. It had nothing to do with sports. It was just a music station. Okay. And so there was a different perspective that I had because it wasn't involving sports. And how can I best put this? Um, I've never had an issue, but I remember one day I was at a Dunkin' Donuts, a Dunks, in Waltham. And I happened to have, I was coming back from a station event, and I happened to have the shirt on not realizing it. And a white woman steps to me and she says, thank you for what you guys do. It's so appreciated here. In other words, she was saying, you now offer something to a great cultural place that we all kind of know is missing at the time, right? And so for people like LeBron or anybody who hasn't grown up in Boston, I think the way Boston can always recapture it is show the importance of blacks in history here in this town, whether it's Martin Luther King doing his very first sermon in Roxbury or for God's sakes, as much as we celebrate people dying for this country, the first man to die for this country was a black man. Now, some people will sit there and say, well, four others died. But yes, even forensics showed that Christmas died first. So there are stories and narratives that can eliminate that, that have nothing to do with sports, but have everything to do with the narrative about Boston from people who have never been. Because the first question I get asked about Boston is, what is it like? I know what they're really asking. Yeah. No, I, get I know it. what they're asking. Well, but see, to, I guess along those lines, yeah. does anybody ever talk about, because all of this, the racist stuff, you hear it about the Red Sox, you hear it about the Celtics, but in terms of the Celtics... Does anybody ever talk about or acknowledge the fact that the Celtics were the maybe the most progressive team in the NBA? Right. First black head coach, first black starting five. Right. You know, like all those things. Like I remember Isaiah Thomas, the OG Isaiah Thomas, yes. was talking about when he was a kid in the 60s, the Celtics, a lot of the black people around the country rooted for them. For the Celtics. Sam the, Jones, the, Sam Jones Casey is like a Jones, hero. Sam Jones, yeah. Bill Russell, yeah. like all those Sam guys. Sam Jones is the initial, he's Michael Jordan before Michael Jordan. Sam Jones is the origins or the genesis of the great North Carolina basketball player. Cedric Maxwell would come through there, Dominique Wilkins, uh, James Worthy. There's all these different players. But it starts with Sam Jones, and all of them grew up watching and becoming Celtics fans. So to your point, it, you know, people, they advance the narrative that they want to advance. Yes. Because they're, it, you know, and that's what I'm saying. Like that, The negativity, especially if it's not necessary. Again, I don't know 
what LeBron James has experienced. But that comment and the way he said it felt like it could have been handled better. And yeah. I would like to see, honestly, because I think it would help, the athletes, the black athletes that play here, I would like to see in response to LeBron James' comment, I would like to see them come out and speak about this and, and comment themselves on their experiences here, good or bad. You know, so why does it have to be a black athlete here in Boston? Why could it not be a conversation with black Bostonians who are part of the structure, right? Because a player can play here for what forty one. It could be here for really forty one games and be gone the rest of the time. You know, players probably don't really live here in the off season. Let, look, let's go to Stephen Fall River. He wants to get in on these LeBron comments. Thanks for calling KJ and Don Darrow. You on WEI? Okay, so thank, well, thanks, Steve, for the attempt. Steve's gone. But, Listen, but again, I, but I, I, just to answer your question, yeah. because a, a, like a normal citizen doesn't have the platform that Jason Tatum or Jalen Brown have. So but if they the comments, live the everyday experience, right? If we're going to say, well, hey, we, how can you comment on here when you're not here? Well, why not have someone of that stature or have players sit down with members of the community and have that conversation? Now, I think they attempted to do that, if you remember, after the Adam Jones situation where they had Cedric Maxwell and a couple other guys, and they all sat at Fenway. And this goes back to what you remember talking about with the Red Sox and the Fenway, uh, Red Sox and the Celtics. You know, there's some people that still hang on to, well, you know, the Red Sox were the very last team in baseball to integrate um, with Pumpsy Green in like 59. So yeah. some people still hang on to that. And but then at the same time, you know what's going on is the Celtics are b- becoming the most progressive, the most progressive sport and team in a sport that will end up becoming you know leapfrogging baseball. I, at, yeah, at I point. just don't get it. Like LeBron, I mean uh, Bill Russell obviously faced a lot of racism when he was here, you know, right. in Waltham and whatever. But and I don't mean a pigeonhole Waltham. I was just like no, was it living, wasn't a Waltham. He lived further north. Just he, being here, he Redding. experienced. He lived in Redding, but yeah. what about like? And I know it was earlier, but Jackie Robinson, and it was a different situation. But he faced racism in Brooklyn. You right. know, there were things that happened. There really horrible things. So, but you never hear New York forever pegged as a racist city. I mean, go listen to go listen to Ken Griffey Jr. talk about his dad's experience playing in New York so, and why he hated the Yankees. But it's you know no one talks about New York being a racist city, and I'm not trying to just throw blame everywhere. I just think for whatever reason, I think bo- what you're I think what you're doing is the correct thing. Is hey look, it's a bigger overarching structural thing. It isn't up it, to right. individuals, right? Well, like, again, like I said, you can buy a lawn sign saying, "Hey, I'm for this particular social matter," but at the same time, there's nobody who lives by you who you can really do life with. Now, again. I've always told people some of the nicest people I've met are are right here in Boston. So it isn't a person-to-person situation. It's a structural thing, and that's probably – and he couldn't speak on that. You would have to have a big-time player talking to some people who live in the structure to get a better comprehensive view of what Boston really is. And I think part of it is um, because of what happened – now, this is a history lesson – because the abolitionists were having meetings here, including Josiah Henson, who people call Uncle Tom, but it was for a good reason. Other people took that narrative and twisted it around, and Boston gets included in, in it as well. So Boston has been this progressive place for blacks going back 200 years. But for other places in the country, they don't want to hear that. And I, where do more, black pe- more to more black people reside? In southern areas of the country. So you're going to get this narrative that it's a, a horrible place, it's racist, it's all this. Uncle Tom is a bad guy, and you've never been to the place to to, to discover these. I'll things. never forget being in Georgia and pulling up at a light behind a guy, and he had on his in his truck, he had a light, a bumper sticker that said it was it had a big Confederate flag, and it said North One South Zero Halftime. Like this, like I've never seen that here, and I know there are more black people in Georgia in Atlanta. But that doesn't mean there's less racist people down there. Well, so, it's a power struggle. It, it, there's power. If you know who is in power, then you can get away with doing those things overtly, right? So if you know that you've always had some type of systematic power structure that is just going to have you as an oppressed in terms of your laws and how you govern and how you police, you know, you're going to you're gonna feel emboldened to do that. Here, you know, that's not the case as much, but, if, if, if at all. I'm just saying, last thing I'm going to say on this for now, yeah, uh, I just want to say, I, I just want to see, like, what's going to help 
our situation as a country. I don't think what LeBron James did and how he said what he said is going to help us. I think what would help is if some of the athletes, some of the people with the big platform, the black people that live in Boston that are part of this community with big platforms, talk about their experiences, especially if they're positive ones. And if they're not, if they do have negative experiences, fine, let's talk about that in a productive way that can get us to a point where we can find a solution. That's what this whole thing needs. It needs leaders. And what LeBron's... What LeBron did was not exercising quality leadership for a person that has the platform and the fame that he has. Yeah, I think starting to discuss the systematic portions of it and understanding how systems work and how some benefit just by being who they are in the system and how others are already kind of behind an eight ball uh, is, a, is a good starting point. Not at the individual, but at, at the not at the micro level, but at the macro. Micro would be fans. Uh, uh, micro would be fans. Macro would be an overall overarching system. It's KJ and Dondero. We continue next here on WEEI.